My name is Jessie Trope Trover. I'm in my 90th year of life and have enjoyed not every minute of it. I've had my ups and downs, but nothing that impeded my journey very much. I was in the sanatorium with bilateral TB for a year and made many friends. And you know one thing I've discovered? That with every one of your downfalls, whatever, the valleys that you go through to get to the mountaintops, you make friends. There are friends everywhere. You make friends in adversity, you make friends in the good times, and uh, that's how your life grows, I guess. The place I was born owes its existence to the seal hunt. Halfway between Paris and Winnipeg, awash in the North Atlantic is Twillingate Island off the northeast coast of Newfoundland. The Labrador Current sweeps southward from Baffin Bay, bringing cold weather, icebergs, and every spring whelping seals to these shores. In the early 1700s, Devonshire farmers crossed the Atlantic from England in search of fish and seals. From the scarce small trees, they raised homes, built boats, and turned the sparse soil to make gardens. In those years, the waters of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland teemed with fish, and for centuries, our salt cod filled hungry stomachs across Europe, the Caribbean, and South America. Massive offshore factory trawlers from all over the world have scraped the Grand Banks bare, erasing habitat and condemning the northern cod and the hundreds of Newfoundland outports who depend on it to the threshold of extinction. My family are still fishing and sealing in this remote corner of the world, though some outsiders have objected to how they and other Newfoundlanders live. Would you like a meat hook stuck in your brain? They all say animal rights people. And I think it's f***ing reprehensible. You people out there, you don't even know whose money you're living off of. You're living off of Central Canada and Western Canada. You don't even f***ing can make your own f***ing way in life. You know, if you don't like it, get the f*** out of the country, f***ing asshole. Some say we are lazy, others say we are savages. My cousin Jack Troke tells me my ancestors were rogues and murderers and pirates from Great Britain. And we've been here a long time. This is my cousin, the late Gary Troke. Gary and his friend Roger Blake lost their lives on the fishing grounds of Twillingate in the fall of 2000. Probably a third of my income comes from sealing, and it's looking better every year. This last couple, three years, we've uh, had a substantial increase. This is Gary with his father, Jack, and his grandfather, the famous Captain Peter Troke. Captain Peter received numerous honors for his role in saving thousands of lives during the tuberculosis epidemic of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. At the end of his life, he worked on Jack's boat, the Lone Fisher, alongside his grandsons, Gary and Hardy. Peter grew up in the same house that my grandmother, Jessie, did. Two families, 21 people, under one roof. The house was um, a typical Newfoundland outboard house, I think it was called Saltbox. It had two porches built on, and uh, Uncle Lewis lived on one side and Father on the other. Oh yes, on our side, I was the eldest. Then it was Lil. And Bessie, and Manuel, and Wilford, and Sally, and Hardy, and myself. I'm Nina, and I'm the last of the family, Heath. Uh, I'm Jim Troke, and I uh, grew up in this area. 
just behind me here. The house was divided, uh, like a lot of uh, houses in those days, uh, two family houses, petition, and you could easily hear what was being said on the other side of that petition. But anyway, when we started singing, and there were always hymns, uh, Uncle Lewis would start on his side, and then all the children would start with them. Is it true that people, you could hear it outside on the... Yes. There was a man walked across the bridge, Chalks Bridge, one night, and he said, if there's any heaven below, it's in Chalks house tonight. Chalks now in the choir in Twillingate with different names because they've married hither and thither, but all the Chalks could sing. The loud archangel's trump shall sound and twice ten thousand thunders roar. Tear up the graves and cleave the ground and let the mighty sea restore. That was our lullabies. <laughs> My name is Florence Troll, and I've been married to my husband Jack for about 50 years now, June coming. Well, I, I don't mind it being there, you know, when Jack and they go out. And, I mean, they've been at it now for years, and I lo he looks forward to it, you know. But now I don't uh, be lonely when he's gone or anything, but now I still miss them. But I'm sort of worried about it because they could be stuck like in the heavy ice or the weather blow it hard and they could have all beach or their boat or something like that, you know. But then again, it's their life view. It's what they got to do, they got to do, you know. Well, most of my life I spent on the sea. You know, I uh, worked on larger vessels and running down south, salt fish, that's so soft. And in 1972, I gave up that and got this vessel built. And then, and then I went fishing. Oh, you start in the morning before daylight, and, and, and you're at it when the, when the sun has long gone down. You just made, you got put four or five hundred animals on the neck of this one, you know, and then start trying to clean up with the six men. And I tell you, nobody got to sing you to sleep one or two o'clock in the morning, you know. So, what do you get up to while they're gone? Well, I'm never idle, especially with my hands. I knit a lot and I make quilts and I cook and bake and I enjoy that, you know. And of course I clean like every woman does, you know. But uh, the time, you know, I goes fast by me doing that. And I'm also involved in a lot of activity things like, I mean, the WI Women's Institute and I'm in the Orange Lodge and I'm in Osville Auxiliary and I'm doing it in the church and things like that. So time goes quick, you know. Now, very often, every year, come in and see me sit down with my feet up. <laughs> I might have a mum on stall when I'm knitting, but I never idle like I said before, and I enjoy it. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're ready for our second setting now. So, would you please uh, sit in and move up here to the front? Fill up the seats up here first. We're going to uh, sing our traditional grace. So you remain, uh, remain seated. Be present at our table, Lord. Be here and everywhere adored. Thy creatures bless and grant that we may taste in paradise with thee. I had to go to the hospital to see Dr. Parsons at work at that time. Every time I ran into him, he'd be after me to come as a nurse's aide. So I, made, I said, well, I'll come this summer, and that'll give me a little bit of money to go on into St. John's in the fall to get my teaching. But by then, I was getting fed up with teaching. I knew I wasn't a good, going to make a good teacher. Why do you make a good teacher? Because I can't teach anybody anything. I've got patience. 
there's teaching, believe it or not, is is is, is a a gift. If you can impart knowledge, it is a gift the same as singing or being able to recite or make a movie. It is something you can do or you can't do, and I couldn't. So I went to Montreal, picked up and handed from one to the other, out of a fishing boat now, to the train in Lewisport going into St. John. On a ship in St. John's, I left on Christmas Eve, 1929. And I was met in Halifax by somebody I'd never seen before. And it was a man, and he said, I saw you come out on deck, and he said, I looked at you, and you turned your face away, because I could see your mother told you not to go speaking to any strange men. How long were you in Montreal? How long before you came oh, home again? Three years plus a month or two. They were all Canadians in my class except me. And uh, anyway, we had to write something on nursing ethics. So I wrote, I suppose I wrote a good paper. And the, the uh, teacher, she asked me to stand up and read my essay. So I stood up and of course, very conscious of my H's, leaving them off and putting them on where they shouldn't be. I put everyone on in the wrong place. I stood up and I read this. I, I'm sure I was trembling. Uh, if I had my time back, I'd say no, I wouldn't, couldn't read it. I'd ask her to read it or whatever. I knew I was doing it too, but you were so self-conscious. I was self-conscious anyway. Going in with a crowd of girls who was sophisticated, city trained, gone to school, some of them to college. No, I'd never been in a lab, never saw anything to do with labs and had to do my exercises. If you know Montreal, the Royal Victoria Hospital is halfway up the mountain, so that from your bedroom window you can see you look right out over the city. And the rush of the traffic in the morning, there was, there was on the before my story, there was a row of rocks outside of the arm where I lived. I lived in Durrell's arm. And there was a row of jagged rocks just outside of the arm. And it was always, if the wind was in, there was always the sea. So the sea made a roar. And I would hear the roar of the city, traffic starting, and I'd think, my, there's a sea on again this morning. And then I'd realize, not the sea, my dear, is it, would I be homesick? I, I, there's, I don't think there's anything worse in this world than being homesick. And I was a grown woman then, too. I was in my 20s. But it took me a long time to get over. I was there for you know, three years.
I guess we had the first Medicare in, in Canada. We did. But just the way you, when you went to the hospital to get yourself fixed, you, nobody had any cash, but everybody had, had lots of food. So you carry potatoes and vegetables and the cars and mutton up, up to the hospital. That's how you pay your, your medical bill. So it's a farm of Medicare. <laughs> <laughs> so but we get vegetables enough out of this area for, for a couple of families. And how long into the into the fall and winter will they last you now? Oh, they'll, well, what we do, the, the beet, the plants, the pickle out of beet, do them by the case. The onions, we, we freeze a lot of onions. And all the stuff, no problem. We keep our carrots, our, our parsnips. We don't need a couple of weeks ago, we can last parsnips that we grew last year. So no, we got no, we got a root cellar over across the way there, Stan. Don't use no, uh, no fertilizer. And uh, no chemicals on bugs. They pick them off, get some glasses around my nose, and picks off little critters, and by the way, don't kill them either. Just remove them to another spot. <laughs> you know, I find it very relaxing, but I must hold it. the situation I found myself in those last two or three years. And I know for sure the people was around, the two things that I do, I talk to my cat a lot, and I talk to my plants a lot. And, uh, you know, it vents off that frustration and the bad thoughts that you get in your mind, and, and you relax. No, scatter smoke and scatter cup of tea. All out, say, boy. How long have you had the garden here? Ever since Gary died. This is a project I started just to, to keep my sanity mostly. My name is Sarah Carter. We are right now in the basement of the Long Point Interpretation Center in uh, Twellingate, Newfoundland. My parents, Suzanne Carter and Gary Troke, opened it. Um, this is sort of like their brainchild. They did it together. Um, and they basically built this establishment to show people from different parts of Newfoundland and different parts of Canada and even all around the world what Newfoundlanders are like and the kinds of things that we do and what is normal for us. Actually, it was him really because he had all these beautiful things um, in boxes, um, tucked in people's attics and out in the shed and things like that and no one was being able to appreciate it. So why did you and Gary want to share all of these interesting objects with people? Uh, Gary... I don't know, Gary, there was something special in Gary. There was a, a, a great, great passion about his home and his life. And um, he, he floundered around a lot in his life, I think looking for a way to express that and do something about it. He became heavily involved in the sealers associations in the province. Um, you know, this, this was a wonderful way for him to express that. I remember when we were getting things ready and he wanted to put up uh, in the washroom there's actually a photograph of, of their ceiling vessel and the blood is all dripping down over it. And I said, Gary, you can't put that up. And he said, I'm putting it up. And I said, well, people are going to get very upset and leave. And he said, I don't care. That's part of our heritage and I want people to know. And actually we only had one person in probably three or four hundred thousand people that have come into the shop only one person has stormed out with a lot of people it just opens up conversation and by the time they leave they have a much better understanding of what we're all about and, and what these people here uh, have been doing why and uh, why Newfoundlanders are the way we are the the whalers uh, used uh there are jackknives as the main tool that's to scrape the, the ridges off of the, the sperm whale tooth 
and their, their calloused hands could be used to, then to give it a final buffing or polish. And they would use in the tip of the jackknife to, to inscribe uh, or engrave a, an image into the surface of the, of the tooth. I feel a connection with that era of sailing ships and that, and I always said that I, I felt that I, that I should have been born earlier and, and had the chance to, to, to walk the deck of a, of a square rigger and climb the riggings of that. Arp seals are one of the most populous air seals in the world. The very name, Arp seal, stirs up an old cauldron of emotions. Everyone has an opinion on what we should do with these cute, cuddly, fish-eating creatures. Some provincial government ministers think we should kill every one of the pests, burn them all. Some movie stars think we should leave them alone and let them live unmolested in our ever-increasingly polluted oceans as they get their multi-million dollar contracts and we are government handouts. The International Fund for Animal Welfare and others keep trying to convince the world we should stop while they pray that we don't. Money, not animals being their business. Scientists like to call them Foca Greenlandica, and we are told not to listen to this science because it came from government, and not to listen to that science because it came from the seal huggers. Then there's the media, who can hardly wait each year for the circus to begin. Finally, there's us, the primary producer, the club-wielding, gun-toting Canadian embarrassment. We have our own skeletons in the closet. Come to think of it, a lot of people make money from seals. We, the primary producer, probably make the least amount of money, and in most cases, are most concerned about the future of the Arp seal, Swoil, Fokia Greenlandica, or whatever else you want to call this enigma of our ever-depleting natural world, even though we bash in their heads with clubs and blow their brains of guns. Well, for one, I'm fed up with incompetent politicians. I'm tired of rich movie stars and the like who know as much about seals as I know about being Captain Kirk. I'm sick of animal welfare groups who are about as concerned with the future of seals as I am about the insects that live in the firewood in my basement. I'm fed up with hypocritical scientists and misinformed sensationalized media coverage and I'm angered with some sealers who treat our resource like it was so much garbage. Why can't common sense prevail? Why is it so different than the hundreds of species we lose each year to extinction? As a sealer, I don't feel that I am asking for much. Just some good scientific advice, good government management, good accurate media coverage, and maybe a true environmental group who realizes that you won't save the seals by destroying what I do any more than you'll save the rainforest by destroying the native peoples. My wife doesn't like the taste of seal, and she doesn't like seeing animals being killed either. However, she does realize that we are lucky enough to live on this rock because of our natural resources. So after I finish shooting seals with a gun, I take them out to shoot them with a camera. In due time, my daughter will make up her own mind. I hope our seals are there for her to shoot with a gun or a camera. In the meantime, I think I'll open a bottle of swile for supper. I'll make a grilled cheese sandwich for my lovely wife. Good evening. So who went berry picking? All of us, everybody that could. Yeah. And did you enjoy it? I loved it. I loved it. Well, you never picked a berry on Sunday. Yeah. I remember sometimes we'd come out of Sunday school and there was a back road where we used to walk down and away from the traffic and everything. There wasn't much traffic anyway. But I remember one time there was blueberries all along the road and I snuck a handful and put them in my mouth and ate them. Felt very guilty the rest of the week. What was it about berry picking that you liked? Everything. The association with... Uh, the association with nature, with being outdoors. Well, one was that I was the babysitter, of course, the oldest of the family. And I got blamed for... Well, didn't get blamed, but if the if the others got themselves messed up when I say I took them on a picnic and mother would say, why didn't you look after her? So I was responsible for all the kids and I could think they grew up hating me, I'm sure they did. But um, anyway, that was my duty. So when I got berry picked by myself, well, that was heaven. Beside that, I always, even now, I look up, I can, I can see in my mind every berry on that hill up there. I loved being out, I loved the woods. 
I had a hate, not a hate, but a fear and a love of the sea. I don't think I could live away from the sea. But sometimes father would take us out in, in punt. Father never had a motorboat. He always had a punt, that's a rowboat. And he'd take us out, I suppose be jigging, but he'd just take us to a little quiet place called the Hole. It was deep water, but I don't think fish ever came in there. We never caught anything anyway. When they'd throw the jigger over and the jigger went down and went out of sight, it gave me that queer feeling of something down there that I couldn't see and I had vague ideas about. So there was always that little bit of fear when I was in a boat, but I couldn't, I wouldn't live away from the sea. These northern waters have spawned many industries, some of them hostile to the way of life here and far more profitable. Brian Davy is executive director of the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Brian Davies formed the International Fund for Animal Welfare in 1969 with the sole intention of stopping the Canadian seal hunt. Years later, he retired with a $2.5 million settlement from the organization, which allowed them to continue to use his image in their campaigns. If I paid myself more than you paid yourself, it's because I'm worth more than you. For animals. Currently, the IFAW has offices in 14 countries. The white coat seal, which has not been hunted in nearly two decades, is still their poster child, reaping nearly $100 million annually in donations. Would we go along to a maternity hospital and start clubbing all the babies there? If you make $12,000 sitting and $4,000 of that comes from sealing, that's clear. How can my livelihood be put in danger the way I live the way I contribute to a society be put in danger because of the emotions of people. Can you talk a little bit about what he tried to do? To well, the most Gary, Gary uh, uh, was trying to convince the public in general, you know, how we done it and why we done it. And he was good at that. He, uh, he traveled down to Massachusetts to meet with Brian Davies and he P.O.I. and a bunch of us traveled right across Canada one time. Gary fought very hard to change people's attitudes around the world um, about, you know, the barbaric uh, sealers down here. And uh, um, a lot of times it felt as though it was in vain. Like a petition that was sent to the EEC, do you think everybody who signed the petition realized the economic importance of the seal fishery? Do you think you realize yourself that I'm so well, What I can't understand about any of this stuff, Dan, you know, you'll, you'll slaughter a thousand chickens for Colonel Saunders. And you've got people gallivanting all over the world coming here in this province, putting our wild game of caribou and moose. And I can assure you a lot of this stuff's not nice. So, uh, to me, back, back when this come on first, you know, there was a lot of doubts in a lot of, a lot of us cheaters' minds, with Jesus, by must be something marvelous what we're doing there. But then when we sit, we take one step back and look at it and, and say, no, I don't think. This is the act effect. Now this, this was designed by the Norwegians. Because we normally, we use a gaff, a much longer handle, with a pike on it. But uh, uh, fisheries brought this as part of your uh, condition to your license, the regulation that this is the tool you had to use. You just lump, you just strike it on the end, three or four good blows, and then you drive this pike down into the skull. In a matter of seconds, the, the creature is dead. But we had, it's a good kill, it's a good tool for killing seals, but we had problems with it moving around. As you can see, you've got a job to hook that in, you see on pull it. And it's not so good a tool for retrieving yourself when you fall out of the water, because the handle is sharp. So this, but this is the tool we got to use. This, this is a legal tool for, for clubbing seals, but we don't, we don't club no seals, and we shoot seals now. All, all seals are shot. But if you got a wounded seal, and you're going to get on how nice to retrieve it, this is what you do it with. 
well, the SEALs didn't always come in, the SEALs. You know, you either had to go a far sealing, go out in small boats, and risk the ice getting you caught out there. And men have been caught out on the ice. Or, uh, my father never went sealing, except unless there was, uh, unless they came into shore like they did when I killed that little one. Very fat turkey in the merry green fields of the lowland. He turned him in to be seen in the merry green fields of the lowland. With a I came home from school and everybody was gone. I was about 12, I suppose, or around 12, 13, around there. But I noticed there was one woman around and I asked where, where they were all gone and she said, the seals were into the rocks. This was on the back side of the island, within walking distance. But she said, the seals are right into the rocks and everybody is down sealing. So she said, I, I couldn't go with them because I had bread to bake, but I'm going as soon as I get my bread baked. And I thought, I'm not going back to school. <laughs> I've gone on the ice too. So we went down and I remember I took a picket off a fence and off we went off the ice, and I crossed one little seal. Breaks my heart now when I think about it. But it was money for me and food, so I snapped him on the head and killed him and brought him in, dragged him in. Somebody pelted him for me, I'm sure, and I, I'm sure I ate joined in eating the body with others, and I sold the pelt and bought wool to knit myself a sweater. That was part of our livelihood seals and seabirds, and I've, eaten, I've even eaten gulls. I was telling somebody one day, I said, gulls would not come in like they do now. Gulls come in and pitch out here on our outside, and uh, no gull would approach Twilligate Island while there was a troke out there with a gun. Jack, last year the IFAW raised nearly $97 million Canadian. Do you think they really want the seal hunt to stop? No. Oh my God, no. That would be the worst scenario. This, this is their biggest, this is their, their biggest fundraiser, is the seal hunt. No, it is not the, there's hundreds of things that these people could, could use their, their talent at and their time to fix things that broke me this world besides this, I can assure you. You know, they're not concerned with waiting with the codfish on the northern tail of the banks. But 75% of the species they drag up are discarded. <laughs> Holy grade. Not concerned about that. Yeah. I remember one winter we had 22 film crews come through our home. Um, we took them out in boat. 
We went to the restaurant with them. We drove them all around. We brought them down here. We explained our life. We explained everything. We, we'd, we'd suit them up with our survival uh, suits and chocolate and hot chocolate and sandwiches and get them to go out to see what it was really like and things like that. And, and nine times out of 10, what came out of it was beneficial. But once in a while, they got burned. And that was very, very hard to take. Gary went to PEI. I don't know if that before he went to the States, maybe with Brian Davis or Astro, and he went up to PEI and he had a big, big rally up there then, you know, because we was getting mauled pretty bad. And everywhere on the media, both and, and in the written press, you know, we were massacred there. Every conceivable thing that you would call a human being. And he used to get so frustrated with that, you know. And, uh, and you know, way they go, they started to go up, up PI and you know, I'll meet some of these people. And this young lady was crowd stepped up and walked up to his face and, and spit on it. There was uh, one incident um, where a man posed as a journalist for a conservation magazine managed to get aboard the Lone Fisher. And uh, Gary didn't go on that trip, actually. I think that was the time he didn't go because we were getting this place set up. And um, to make a long story short, the man was working for the IFAW, and, uh, and it was horrible the way um, it felt like the whole world turned on Gary and his father and the other members of the crew. Um, we all took it terribly hard uh, in a personal way. I remember on the news that night, a lady in town uh, was interviewed, and she said, oh, it was disgusting that the Trokes took money to go out and do this, this thing, you know, and to hurt the other sealers in the area and things like that. And it was just, it, we were attacked, or I should say they were attacked, but I felt part of it um, were attacked on a personal level as well as a professional level. Um, it went on for years. Finally, um, the man who did the job for the IFAW publicly apologized and, uh, and said that he saw nothing other than the utmost in professionalism out on that boat. But by then, the damage was done. And it was too late. It was shortly after Gary died. And I went to the cemetery and I sat down and I, I felt that, you know, I wish he'd lived long enough to have heard that. Sorry. Once I was on the boat, I really felt really, really badly about lying about my identity because, because Jack Trope was just a really, really nice guy and um, I very much respected him. The crew of, um, of Jack Trope's uh, boat was um, very efficient and, and very professional, I felt. But before I went on the hunt, I was told horror stories about um, how cruel the whole thing is. It didn't really seem any more cruel than um, than slaughtering animals in the slaughterhouse. So I felt that, you know, I was lucky in a way and that my footage could prove that there are people who care about um, how the hunt is done. And that's what I felt about Jack Trow. My name is Annamika Rowell. I was involved with the Canadian seal hunt uh, for about 12 years from the animal rights side um, while I was working for the International Fund for Animal Welfare in the 1980s and early 90s. Before I went to two sealing areas, I was led to believe that sealers are savages. Uh, they were barbarians. But then when I started seeing the other side of the issue and I came to some conclusions by myself that really it wasn't as bad as it was being portrayed by IFA. They didn't like that too much because I started coming up with arguments to change the way we were running the issue. I approached them and I said, why don't you come on stream with us as inshore sealers? Go out and tell the world you're going to work with these sealers. We'll ask for a uh, for the quota to stay the same, 186,000 animals, until markets say so. We'll set up a tribunal 
of scientists, your scientists, DFO scientists, independent scientists, to, in, to make sure that the quotas stay at a sustainable yield. And you can say to the world, look, rather than going and destroying what these people do, we are going in and working with them. So they can live in comfort, seals can live in relative comfort, uh, but being harvested. It was a very good plan. It was very reasonable. Uh, the sealers would have gone for it because he got their support. I talked to a high-placed uh, manage management person in IFA on the phone, and this person told me, yeah, it could be. Everything was going along just fine, and then all of a sudden it was all over. I came home and Anamiku was fired, I think, a couple days after. The spring seal hunt, like the fall harvest of berries, was a vital link that kept my grandmother's generation alive. Today, the people of Twillingate still live a life that is thoroughly entwined with the natural world. They have also witnessed firsthand the destruction of their environment. When the IFAW chooses not to work with these people, and instead continues collecting millions of dollars in the name of saving baby seals, it leaves this community, and others like it, wondering just what it is that the protesters are trying to save. You, you people want some peppers? They won't pay yeah. me, but I, I will. You see, he's not in New Zealand already. How do you feel about the meat that doesn't get used? It goes back to the environment. Every little creepy creature thing on the bottom, even codfish feeds on it. We've, cut, we've, we've got a number of codfish with peppers and parts of seal. So it just settled to the bottom and all the little worms and all the little crustaceans and everything on their feet on it. Give it a month or so to nothing left in the bones and then the environment will use up that. So I got no problem with that. And what's the best way to cook them, Jack? Well, we just put them in, put them in a roaster with a Cover the strips of salt pork and your, your salt and some taste and a bit of pepper. That's it. Can you talk about what happened to Gary? Gary? Uh, our younger son, he, uh, he was in, that's when we had, uh, they opened, after the first moratorium shut down, they did open it up again, the codfish. And uh, I believe it was 7,000 pounds, something he had kids. And he and, he and the young man that was married uh, to, uh, to our granddaughter for, for three months, they had nits out there off Long Point. And fisheries had one of these stupid regulations in place, you must retrieve your gear Saturday and set it back on the bottom again Monday. And he went out Saturday to try to get, try to get his gear, and he got, he got it all except three nets. And Sunday morning, and still the good reason went on the land from an hour, he's a good sea on. Come down, he's going to go out. And I, I said to him, I said, Gary, boy, he said, I wouldn't go out and touch that. He said, boy, if he wants to take it, he'll take it. But he, he never, never left, and he went on. And both went down. And it's like that. Yeah. Gary's body we got. Roger, we never saw him after marriage for three months. So in all, life is not all that easy. But we still find time to laugh and carry on, because you can't have it no other way. You just can't, things like that happen, you just can't collapse and crawl in over some other way, you know. But I come so close, if anybody in the world think of blowing my brains out because of Gary dying. And I'll never forget, the minister tell me, and he was pretty strong about it too. He said, John, he said, you lose that. He said, boy, he said, that's the cowardly way to do it. And he was a great big man, so and I'll never forget that. He said, you, you accept your responsibilities just like everybody else do. I stood on, when, when we went out dice after that spring, I stood going that corner there, and you get that little voice telling you to jump. Jump. And he was going to go in the wheelhouse. That's how, that's how you can let yourself go, you know. That meant easy, because right? he, like I said, he was, he was everything that, that 
that you wanted your son to be. Granted, he wore long hair, the queerest kind of clothes. He'd drive me right out of my mind. And same thing, father. And father taught the world. And he taught the world, father. He was the life of the party. Never a dull moment where he was. Shortly after the death of Gary and Roger on October 8, 2000, Suzanne wrote to the Minister of Fisheries. Her letter contained the following words. Decisions which affect and risk the lives of so many fishers should not be arbitrarily imposed by bureaucrats. Fishers should be involved in the formulation of such policies and not be made to feel threatened by them. Sadly, this was not the case. My hope is twofold. Firstly, that you will never suffer what I am suffering right now, and secondly, that some good may come of this horrible tragedy. If only bureaucrats would stop to think that it's people's lives that they're affecting. Not nameless, faceless people, but living, laughing, breathing, beautiful people like Gary Troke and Roger Blake were just days ago. It would be a simple matter to build some flexibility into this regulation, and this should be done. No one else needs to die. About a month after the accident, the Federal Department of Fisheries issued a notice that they would no longer prosecute fishers for not retrieving their nets in dangerous seas. And as they made their way over from England in their fishing schooners, every year they loaded the fishing schooners with soil from England for ballast and all of the soil, practically all of it, was dumped right there in Hart's Cove. And though it is a fact of history, and that soil down there is Devon soil, that soil is a reminder of our roots that goes back for generations and generations, and it speaks of a people who are proud, who are independent, who were strong, who were neighborly, who met the challenges of the sea and living with stoicism, courage, and faith. My father, Gary Troke, was a person who was about as proud of his heritage as anyone could possibly be. He loved this place and everything about it. It was always his dream to see the young people in the Twellingate area educated about the place we live in. He spent a great deal of his time and energy trying to promote our rich cultural heritage and to preserve and protect our natural resources. He would have been so happy and proud if he could have seen this. First of all, tell me what your name is. Travis. You play the accordion, don't you? I've seen you play the accordion. Um, why did you decide to do singing? Well, I was out with my dad last year, and I love singing. When did you go singing first? Uh, How old are you now? I grew up coming down here with my family every summer and uh, I spent a lot of time out in boat fishing and things like that and uh, I only felt alive when I was here and when we would start our journey back to Toronto 
my parents can tell you that I didn't even speak sometimes because I was just beginning my year-long wait to be here again. So when my life fell apart um, when I was in my late 20s, I came home. I've always considered this home. And um, I know after the accident where I lost Gary and Roger, um, I wondered, you know, is this going to affect my love for this place? And the answer is no. It's been very difficult and it's my relationship with the sea now is a love-hate relationship. Um, but I don't feel comfortable if I can't see it from wherever I am. I'd much, much rather be here, and this is where I'm going to stay. The heels are dug in. The most I learned from my dad was respect other people, the rights, and the rights more so, you know. And he used to tell me, you know, boy, you get yourself in a bad situation, he said, and everything's come tumbling down around your ears. He said, the more you complain, all you do is make it worse for yourself and everybody else around you. He said, grab yourself up, he said, the slack of the pants and die job, because you can't change anything. It's done and that's it. And that was... Uh, I thought about that a million times since I lost Gary and, and Roger, and, and uh, gets a lot of strength from that, you know. Forever with the Lord, amen, so let it be. Life from the dead is in that word, tis immortality. Here in the body pent, absent from him I roam. Yet nightly pitch my moving tent, a day's march nearer home. The last two lines I repeat over and over. I nightly pitch my moving tent now, a day's march nearer home. It's more real to me now than it ever was. Yeah, life. It's been a good life. And the sky was beautiful. I never saw the sky so so beautiful before. I've never seen it so beautiful since. It seemed like everything came in one spot. So when I went off duty, of course, I wrote, I wrote about it. Now, this foolish thing that I wrote was not supposed to be in this book. But anyway, Anne likes it. So, just foolish, so I'll start. Oh, purple dawn, <laughs> thy glowing tints appear, painting the eastern sky with glorious, with gorgeous rainbow hues, surpassing far man's skill in trying to produce a thing of heavenly beauty. Each light or darker shade files into place, as if consigned there by sense of duty. Producing thus an interwoven screen of burning fires and smoldering passion beds from which some magic sprite matures and wings its way to earth through silent space with just a spark of that magnetic power to touch my soul and softly interlace it to thy superhuman loveliness. I am no longer now an earthly mortal weighted with cares and burdens, shared or alone, but fairy-like and free from earthly portals, I drift eastward to thy eternal dome, then sport we there on airy wings of morning to breathe the ethereal minstrel lay. I don't know where I got it. Till sunbeams chase thy shifting shadow westward, and open up the curtains of the day. And then there's a space. Only the haunting memories remain, prompting my soul through hours of toil to pay its tribute sweet, enchanting song and mirth, and thus with flowers and birds express my share of thee, O purple dawn. <laughs> and you know, a young 20-year-old, 20 20-odd-year-old. 20 that would never have seen light if Sheila hadn't made this book.